Did you ever have to perform a dissection in school? Maybe you had to carve up a fetal pig, or slice into a frog while nightmarish visions of Kermit and a widowed Miss Piggy danced in your head. Though it's rarely a pleasant experience, unless your tastes are on the morbid side, most biology teachers would agree that the best way to learn how something works is to take it apart. As distasteful as it can be to hold a frog's tiny liver in your hands, it definitely does give you a better sense of the pieces that make up the complete creature. But what if there was an easier way to look at the individual parts of a living being? What if you could take it apart without ever having to prep a scalpel or stain your hands with the blood of innocent frogs? Like most of the seemingly impossible things in our world, the SCP Foundation discovered something that allows its users to do just that. In fact, it can handle a lot more than just a frog, and its applications go far beyond the confines of a high school science lab. SCP-291 is a small, plain steel building with a large door on one side. The door has no handle or knob and functions similarly to a garage door. The door cannot be pried open by any ordinary means, and the inside of SCP-291 can only be accessed if the structure is connected to a suitable power source. Once a power source has been connected, the door races and exposes a room inside. It is small, about 4 by 2 meters. It contains a console board, a large screen, and a plexiglass container resembling a coffin. How very sinister. The coffin is large enough to contain a human under 7 feet tall. So sorry, Ferdinand the Cannibal, you're going to need to sit this one out. The coffin sits on a conveyor belt with several tubes connected to the wall above it. On the opposite side of the room, there are holes of varying sizes, each containing a small door that can be opened or closed. Because initial observation indicated that SCP-291 was intended for some kind of human testing, a D-class test subject was selected for experimentation. The subject was instructed to lie down in the coffin and wait to see what would happen next. The display screen lit up, depicting a grid-lined image of the test subject. Buttons along the console board adjusted the image, showing the skin, muscles, and organ systems of the person in the coffin. There were no words or numbers on the screen, and all of the buttons appeared to have only two settings, on and off. When one of the researchers pressed the first button on the console, the tubes above the coffin began pouring a blue liquid into it. The test subject reacted with confusion, but did not experience any adverse effects. They quickly lost consciousness, indicating that the liquid was some sort of sedative. The liquid continued to pour into the coffin until the vessel was completely filled, at which point it congealed into a thick gel. The test subject's breathing and heartbeat slowed to a stop, and the conveyor belt suddenly creaked to life. The coffin was carried, test subject inside, through a small door that immediately locked behind it. The small room was filled with the sounds of gears turning, machinery clinking, and motors whirring. The display screen was taken over by a large rectangle, resembling a traditional loading screen. After 30 minutes, the process was complete, and the back door of the room unlocked itself. When the researcher walked through the back door, they found another room with a conveyor belt and a row of two dozen lockers. Each locker was opened, one at a time, and its contents removed for examination. Inside each, the research team found a different portion of the test subject's body in a block of some unidentified clear substance. The body was divided in the lockers into these separate parts. Brain, lungs, and diaphragm, heart, digestive system, reproductive organs, left eye, right eye, upper left torso and arm, upper right torso and arm, lower left torso and upper leg, lower right torso and upper leg, lower left leg and foot, lower right leg and foot, lower left arm and hand, lower right arm and hand, neck and head, upper skeletal system, lower skeletal system, lymphatic and circulatory system, and skin. Phew, the miracle of the human body, right? boundless in its fascinating complexities. Each block of body parts was placed back in its designated locker, and the second button on the console was pressed. At this point, the doors to the organ locker sealed themselves shut, and the sound of the machinery working filled the small space once again. This continued for a duration of approximately 45 minutes. When the machinery went silent, a new plexiglass coffin emerged into the main room, with the test subject inside. He looked identical to how he had looked at the start of the experiment, with no evidence that he had previously been disassembled. The blue liquid slowly evaporated from the container, and the test subject opened his eyes. The lead researcher conducted an immediate interview with the reassembled subject, 
who reported no memory of the process after initial exposure to the blue liquid. They insisted that the process had been like a good night's sleep, which honestly makes us pretty eager to take it for a spin. A medical examination determined that there were only a few changes to the test subject during the disassembly and reassembly. When they returned to consciousness, the test subject's stomach was empty, they were naked, and all of their hair was gone. With this new understanding of SCP-291's anomalous properties, the Foundation decided to continue their experimentation. With each new test, the experiments became more creative and, unsurprisingly, more depraved. First, a D-class subject was placed in the coffin and disassembled. Then, instead of placing the various body parts in their designated lockers, the vital organs were removed from their storage before reassembly was attempted. This resulted in the equipment shutting down completely. A researcher pressed the third button, which forced a hard reset of the entire process, causing all of the blocks of body parts to eject via an exit hatch. During the next experiment, non-vital organs were removed before the subject's body was reassembled. The appendix and gallbladder were left out, and when the subject regained consciousness, these organs were still gone. However, there was no visible damage or scar tissue in their place. They were simply gone, as if they had never been there in the first place. So, if body parts could be removed from a test subject, could new body parts be added? Could existing body parts be replaced with different ones? A D-class subject in need of a skin graft following a flamethrower-based accident was placed in SCP-291. Once taken apart, a portion of healthy skin donated by another, somewhat unwilling D-class subject was placed in the locker, along with the skin already present there. Once the subject was put back together, the healthy skin had replaced the damaged skin with no adverse effects. Repeat attempts at this test showed that it was effective for limb transplants, heart transplants, and kidney transplants with a 0% failure rate across all tests. After determining that SCP-291 could be used for an untold amount of good, making organ donations easier and safer than ever, the Foundation naturally had to pivot to something more useless but interesting and likely horrifying. After all, it's not like they could ever just make anomalous technology available to the public, right? Two D-class subjects, one man and one woman, were disassembled by SCP-291. The brains of the test subjects were swapped, and then they were reassembled. When they awoke, the subjects had the personalities and memories of the brain placed in their body. In a turn of events previously only seen in blockbuster comedies like Freaky Friday and the live-action Scooby-Doo movie, seminal piece of cinema, the subjects had swapped bodies. They were subsequently disassembled. Their request to look at their new bodies naked having been swiftly denied, and the brains were returned to their rightful bodies. After the experiment was finished, the subjects appeared mostly normal. However, they did complain of disorientation as well as mental and physical discomfort over the next several days. After going through two brain transplants in one day, though, that's really the least you can expect. After perfecting the practice of swapping body parts between different human subjects, the ghoulishly curious research team decided to take things in an interspecies direction. A variety of test subjects, including cats, dogs, lizards, fish, mice, and, of course, humans, were selected for this next round of experiments. Twenty tests were performed using these new subjects, and only three of the experiments were successful in transferring body parts from an animal of one species to another animal of a different one. Attempts to swap body parts between mammals and reptiles or fish proved disastrous. When a fish and a human were both disassembled and the fish's gills were placed with the human's body parts, neither creature survived the reassembly process. The human awoke with a new set of gills embedded in their neck and immediately began gasping for the oxygen they could not take in. Within minutes, they had suffocated. The fish's fate was even worse. It did not reassemble so much as it became a pile of goo, scales, and two floating eyeballs. Experimentation with a human and a lizard yielded similar results, turning the lizard into a puddle of organic matter and killing the human test subject after only a few minutes. As disastrous as the failed cross-species tests were, the successful ones were almost as bad. Trial 001 involved a cat and a human. Not wanting to attempt too much at once, the research team opted to just swap out one organ, the left eye. Both subjects survived the transfer and were able to use their new eye. The human subject reported full use of the cat's eye, with improved night vision in addition to trouble seeing color. The cat did not enjoy its new eye nearly as much as the human subject and had clawed its human eye out of its head by the end of the following week. 
In Trial 007, a successful brain transfer was performed between an adult human man and an English Mastiff. The man in the Mastiff's body expressed discomfort with walking on all fours and asked to be returned to his body as soon as possible. The Mastiff in the man's body adjusted to bipedal locomotion in a few hours, but was disassembled after urinating on a researcher's shoes. The final successful trial, and the most unnerving, was Trial 016. A female D-class test subject's reproductive organs were swapped with those of a pregnant Labrador retriever. An ultrasound conducted after the transfer indicated that the Labrador fetuses survived the procedure and could conceivably be carried to term by the human subject. Several members of the research team began to take bets on whether or not she would end up giving birth to puppies, but the transfer was reversed within the day, so we'll never know what exactly would have happened. Perhaps that's for the best. Personally, we hope the Foundation's Ethics Committee gives some of these scientists a very stern talking to about their behavior on this one. When not in use for testing, SCP-291 is to be disconnected from any power sources. At least two personnel are positioned outside of its containment at all times, standing guard, and these personnel must be swapped out every week. When it is not connected to any power sources, SCP-291 is considered harmless, though it should still be treated with caution. The main entryway remains closed and locked when there is no available power source, but the door can be opened manually from the inside in the event of an emergency. Any disassembled organisms are stored in a locker in the containment facility, labeled with a Sharpie marker in order to keep track of what specimens are stored there. Whether this is the same Sharpie used to label food in the break room fridge is unknown, but just like Dr. DiRamiro's ham sandwich, it's best to leave these items untouched. Any personnel found to be responsible for missing specimens will be transferred to another project and receive a strongly worded email. Now go check out SCP-1981 Ronald Reagan cut up while talking and SCP-095 and SCP-2295 The Bear with the Heart of Patchwork for more scintillating safe class SCPs.